Last time we broke out of a chicken farm. Well, this time, we're breaking in. You may have me. It's an impossible mission. They're going to turn everyone into nuggets. Find those chickens. Hang on, Fowler. Oh, there go the goujons. We can do this. <laughs> What were some of the challenges and what did you talk about when you started planning what the sequel would, would, cover, would cover? Trying to come up with an idea that felt like a worthy follow-up because uh, the first film was um, so nicely received and then each year it, it uh, kind of kept growing in uh, popularity. Part of it was that Ardman had a, a deal at DreamWorks and had gone on to uh, do Flushed Away and then Jeffrey Katzenberg was always very keen to do a Wallace and Gromit film and you know, it takes a long time to make these movies. And so, you know, each one taking three, four years, rolling into the next one, uh, that took a little while. Uh, but mostly we were trying to figure out what the what the best idea was. And so when when I got the call from Ardman saying, we're, we're talking about, I mean, this might've been 2013, uh, we're thinking about doing another, a, a, a sequel finally. Uh, we, me and Nick and Pete, this was before Paul was involved, um, instantly landed on the same premise, which was this time they're breaking in, felt like the most logical mm -hmm. uh, next step. You definitely kept the feel of the first one, but there was a fire. Um, Famous fire. Would you tell us how that impacted? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Anybody who's ever worked at Ardman is used to, it's, it was like one of the nat you know, national disasters in the UK, it was the fire that happened at Ardman, but actually it happened in a storage facility. Um, and it was difficult because the key thing with making these films is actually the moulds for the characters. So the characters themselves over time, I'm afraid, degrade and will fall apart, so you'd have to remake them. But we lost all the moulds in that fire. So one of the challenges here was the first thing we had to do was redesign all of the puppets from scratch. So even when we know we knew what they looked like, they're actually completely original would you tell us a little bit about some of the sets? Like how, how large was uh, uh, the, um, the compound, for example? Well, as Kerry said, the, you know, the, the facility where things are made is a massive warehouse on the outskirts of Bristol. Um, what we do would, is divide the floor up into different units. So some of the units would be really small. Um, you know, literally a character on a table this kind of size here and then you go right up to the layer, which would be enormous. And one of the challenges always is about scale is that you can't get too big because the roof is a limitation in the building. So often you would do set extensions, you know, so either digitally or you'd film extra elements elsewhere and then stick to them together in post. But the, you know, the sets can be massive. And it's quite a physical job then for the animators, isn't it, Kerry? They, they have to climb over the, the sets to try and animate the characters. And it, is, you know, it takes a long time. The set for the island and all those huts was probably from the edge of this step to you know, maybe 10 rows back and from aisle to aisle. That one particular set is massive. If you're a fan of making Legos or like, I mean, <laughs> that's what it is on the most It's amazing. like a big toy shop. It is, it? it's on just the most amazing scale. And um, my wife and I actually toured the floor one day and you go in and it's really draw dropping to look at these miniature sets and the level of detail. And then there's poles everywhere holding the, you know, the, the uh, the characters in place. Everyone, you know, one of the things, if you're a fan of Ardman, one of the things that you love is you go through the film and you're always going to see thumbprints and fingerprints on characters' necks. And I just love the low tech. I love the fact that you feel the human touch literally on these films. In fact, CG's gotten so good today that they could go in and fake putting those in if they want, but they, they don't do that actually. To what extent did you use newer techniques or stay with the original? Well, they use them all the time. You know, I think it's it, because it's such an old filmmaking technique, stop motion. It goes way back to the beginning of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. You're still trying to keep, you know, that process alive. But then all of the extra things are about either speeding things up so you can make the process slightly faster, or you can make things bigger. You know, and that that's the advantage. So you're always looking at ways to do that to improve the ability 
to kind of you know make the film slightly cheaper to make or make them larger with the money you've got. Um, so there are set extensions which can be digital. They can be physically built bits of set that then we green. we we stick in with green screen. Um, you know everything is evolving. So even the puppet technology is impressive. You know when you really understand what sits underneath the puppets and how the model makers make them, it's you know it's extraordinary. So it's a it's a very low tech form of filmmaking with lots of high technology in it. Crowd scenes get a lot easier with CG. The technology is so much better. I can't tell the difference between which chickens are clay, especially in the big crowd scenes. So in the first film, and, and we have a the shot that opens this film from the first film where all the chickens are lined up, there were literally that many chickens. Uh, and the, one of the problems in the first film is we had to do everything on two different scales. We had an, an A scale and a B scale. So the chickens are not much bigger than this. Um, and then the Mrs. Tweedy model would be, you know, this tall. Um, but if we, so you can't put those two in the same shot together. Um, but if we had to keep it to scale, then Mrs. Tweedy would be human size and you can't make a model that big. So when they're in the same shot, you had to, you know, we would make boots and things like that to be in the shot. Um, and now with computers, we don't have to, they didn't have to build on two different scales. No, not as much. As you don't much. use as much as you would have originally. And uh, yeah, so it, it's great. It, it still allows you to do what, you know, what's important in the process. And things like cleanup is the other thing that you don't think about is when you have a character that's the size that Kerry's talking about and you put it on a screen like this, a tiny speck of dust looks enormous. It looks like a rock on the yeah. face of the character. So originally you'd spend hours cleaning the characters and they still try to do that. But we have the advantage now we can send it off to, to a CG, you know, VFX house to do a quick cleanup. But and, you, you and do really still feel that, you know, the, the hand of the artist. Yeah, exactly. Oh, very much. And that's the, that's the and, key. And that, that has stayed consistent. Well, I don't think what people realize in animation is that the animators are the other half of the acting. They get the voice first. You know, the actors are coming in and doing it vocal only. And then with the help of Sam, trying to figure out how those things get physicalized is them bringing their own acting ability to these characters. And I love it. The Ardman movies always have, you know, these wonderful references and homage to other films and gags, and uh, this was no exception. Yes. Um, what are some of your favorites in this film? My absolute favorite gag, and I wish I had written it, but my favorite gag in the movie is the retinal scan um, and going inside, and it's just a low-tech book of uh, eyeballs that you're looking at. That was a storyboard. I know, it was a storyboard artist, yeah. and that's the other great thing about animated movies is that storyboard artists, unlike in, li you know, in live action, they're primarily plotting camera moves and and particularly on an effects heavy movie, but storyboard artists in animation are an addendum to the writing team. You know, they're bringing gags, they're bringing, um, you know, great humor and detail, especially through physical comedy. So all of that, I mean, uh, when John and I were writing the first draft, we wrote some gags and you can imagine looking at movies like Ocean's Eleven and Mission, Mission Impossible, Impossible and, you know, that, um, it's it's just fun to see chickens doing these things for some reason, um, especially the chickens that look like this with these massive teeth. But um, all the use of of um, you know Ginger's rubber sucker gun and throwing in the ruler that splits open and holds open the you know the ingenuity that you would see in a Mission Impossible and bringing that down to household props and and discarded things that you would find in a junkyard and them repurposing those. I just think is such the charm of these movies um, because you're taking advantage of scale um, and the uniqueness of the, of the world that you're in. I mean, it's, it's, you've got to take advantage of the fact that you're animating. How involved were um, Nick Park and uh, Peter Lord in this? Yeah, uh, well, very early on, um, in the early development, uh, Nick was off um, making his Wallace and early Gromit. Man, was uh, well, he was finishing Early Man, yeah. and he was exhausted, and then he's on to another Wallace and Gromit movie. Um, Pete was very involved uh, every step of the way. Uh, but, you know, the one thing, when Sam Fell came on, who's a very experienced uh, director in his own right, and w out of respect for him, you know, we had to sort of, you know, here's, I, I wrote the film, created these characters, 
Nick and Pete um, created them, uh, directed the first film. But it was our job to sort of step back and play a supporting role so that Sam could sort of make this movie his own, which he did a, a beautiful job of. But with with the guidance of, of Pete as one of the owners of Ardman and overseeing everything uh, and just sort of kind of making sure that that we're all staying in the same chicken run universe that we knew and had created. Um, so um, Pete more so than Nick, only because Nick was uh, off trying to crack his own Wallace and Gromit story. But every screening, every draft, um, uh, and them always weighing in because they're just a wealth of great ideas. Well, yeah, it's, it's a very collaborative process, isn't it, I think? Yeah. Well, all of you, the whole team did created a wonderful and fun film and uh, it will be uh, streaming worldwide uh, December 15th, 15th yeah. on Netflix. Um, thank you so much Thanks for joining so much. us. Congratulations. Thanks for sticking around. Yeah.